Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're hailing from. Welcome to another episode of Cloud Tech Thursdays here on OpenShift TV. I'm Chris Short, executive producer of OpenShift TV. We are joined by a bunch of friends here from Red Hat, as well as a special person from Amy will tell us. Amy, Hi. how are you doing today? Good. Let me go ahead and introduce my compatriots first. We have Josh Berkus, who is the Kubernetes community person here at Red Hat. We have Mike Perez, who is the Ceph storage community architect, and myself, Amy Marish, who is the OpenStack community person here at Red Hat. And we are very pleased to announce that today we have Belmera Morera from CERN to talk about scaling the OpenStack cloud at CERN. Belmero? So, hello, uh, my name is Belmir Moreira. Um, I'm a computer engineer at CERN. Um, I joined uh, around 12 years ago. Um, initially, I was working server consolidation and how to virtualize the batch service that is a huge service at CERN. Uh, but rapidly moved my focus into cloud computing and how to deploy and manage a large scale uh, infrastructures. Um, I'm also a member of the OpenStack Technical Committee and also co chair of the OpenStack Large Scale SIG. And I'm really happy to, um, to be invited to, to be here to talk with you about the CERN infrastructure. Awesome. So, Cool. You, you said you have a short presentation? Uh, it's not that short. Uh, okay. Your slides. Fair enough. Okay, I, think, I think it'll be enough for the hour. Um, <laughs> I can start sharing. It's CERN. We're talking large scale here. Right. Can't be a short presentation. <laughs> All right. Can you see it? Yes. Yep. Come on. They, they accelerate things to the speed of light. That's true. Exactly. Close to the speed of light. <laughs> so that's why I'm going to through very fast for this slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I can start. So, this session uh, it's about how we scale uh, OpenStack at CERN. So, currently, we run thousands of nodes and thousands of virtual machines, and we go through through the steps uh, from the beginning in 2013 to to today. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, the audience is not familiar with CERN. So in the next couple of slides, I'll give you an overview about the organization and the role of the CERN cloud infrastructure in the organization. So CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Uh, it was established in 1954, initially with only 12 member states. Uh, and this number has been growing over the years. Currently, there are 23 member states. The lab sits in the border between France and Switzerland, and it's very, very close to Geneva. The mission of the organization is to do fundamental research uh, in the particle physics field. CERN is the biggest international scientific organization in the world. More than 10,000 scientists from more than 100 countries uh, work in the organization. Not, not everyone is a staff member. It's mostly people from different universities around the world. So to help understand the universe, uh, CERN provides a unique range of particle accelerator facilities. The accelerator complex at CERN is a succession of uh, different machines, uh, accelerators, that accelerate particle beams to higher energies, very close to the speed of light. The LHC uh, is one that you can see clearly in the satellite picture is the CERN largest accelerator. It's also the world's largest accelerator with a 27 kilometers diameter. And it crosses two countries, France and Switzerland. Uh, for comparison, you can see the Geneva airport here and to have an idea about the size of this machine. Here is the CERN main site. And these are other accelerators where the particle beams travel before being injected in the Large Hadron Collider. Um, so the LHC accelerates not only one, but two beams of particles that travel in opposite directions, and they collide in very precise points that are the experiments. So ATLAS, ALIS, CMS, and LHCB. 
So what is quite fascinating to me is that all of this is 100 meters underground. And this is how the tunnel looks like. You can see the magnets. So these big blue pipes that you see here, there are around 10,000 of them in the whole tunnel. Each magnet can measure between five to 15 meters and can weigh up to 35 tons. Inside each magnet, there are two pipes uh, where the particle beams travel in opposite directions. These are electromagnets so, and superconducting. This means that they can conduct electricity without any resistance. However, to achieve superconductivity states, they need to be um, at very, very low temperatures. So minus 271.5 degrees Celsius, which is even lower than the temperature of outer space. As you can imagine, the cooling process takes a few weeks and requ requires tons and tons of helium. So these are the experiments. ATLAS, EMS, LHCB, and ALICE. These are the particle detectors where the collisions occur. These machines are huge. Uh, they have up to 45 meters long, 25 meters in diameter, and more than 12,000 tons. And of course, I, everything is 100 meters underground. Uh, Mike visited this uh, some, some time ago. A detector is basically a digital camera, but they can take up to 40 million pictures a second. This produces up to one petabyte of raw data every second. Of course, we cannot handle all this data. Well, our search system doesn't support this. So what physicists do, they have triggers in the experiments that try to identify in real time the interesting events and everything else is discarded. So at the end, we end up with a few gigabytes per second that are stored for analysis. Uh, even though per year we store around 90 petabytes of data uh, that needs then to be analyzed. So this is how it looks, uh, an event after reconstruction. Um, and with all these pictures, uh, physicists can have a representation of the collision events. The, the analysis of all these data gives, gives physicists insights how the particles interact. But detectors are not only underground at the CERN site, they are also in space. So this is AMS, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, that was installed in the International Space Station in 2011 to measure antimatter and cosmic rays and to search for dark matter. All this data that uh, AMS uh, generates is transferred to Earth uh, to be analyzed, and most of it is analyzed in the CERN cloud. Okay, so this was a very brief introduction about the mission of the organization and what it does. So now let's start talking a little bit about the cloud infrastructure. Um, so to process all of this data and to support the, the scientists all around the world, CERN also provides compute resources uh, to the scientific community. Over 90% of the resources in the compute in the data center are provided um, through the CERN's OpenStack private cloud. And to understand the motivation uh, why we build a private cloud, we need to go back through uh, the beginning. So 29, 2011, and, uh, and then we will see the evolution of the cloud infrastructure over the years and some of our architecture decisions. Uh, if you have any question, please interrupt me at any time. So this is the uh, data center in Geneva. It's a building from the 70s. It was designed to have a Cray supercomputer in the middle at that time. Of course, this evolved. It was upgraded over the years. Now it's a normal data center. Uh, this It has two floors. This is one of the floors. Um, but one of the limitations that we have in this data center is the power capacity. Currently, it has a power capacity of four um, megawatts and is not easy to, to extend the data center. So that's why if you visit now the, the center, you'll see that most of the racks are not completely full. 
Usually they are all full and power constraints is one of the reasons. So this is another data center that the CERN operated um, from 2013 to 2019, over six years. And there we only run compute nodes uh, for the OpenStack clouds. All the compute nodes uh, for computing, uh, for processing, um, were uh, for the OpenStack clouds. So this is in Hungary, and um, it was a huge challenge for us because when we launched in production our cloud infrastructure, we had two different locations, one in, at CERN Geneva and the other in Hungary. So the challenge was not only to deploy OpenStack at that time, but also to run these different locations transparently. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, and these are another location when, where we run our cloud infrastructure. These are now con compute containers with high density for computing. Um, and you can see some when they were installed and this cooling um, hardware being installed. All right, so this is one of our dashboards for monitoring. Um, you can see the size of our current cloud infrastructure. So we have around um, 300,000 cores uh, in the clouds, um, 3,400 users, uh, more than 4,000 projects, uh, around 30,000 virtual machines. This changed a lot. We are in the process that we are um, decommissioning a lot of hardware because it, we are replacing it. So that's why you see this big drop in compute nodes and number of PMs that we had at the beginning of the month. We also have a, a lot of services in the cloud. So we have Ironic to provision bare metal. You, we have uh, around 8,000 uh, bare metal nodes. Uh, Magnum clusters. Um, usually most of these clusters are Kubernetes, more than 600. Uh, and also volumes for Cinder. You can see that we have a lot of uh, block storage, more than three petabytes. So quick question from the audience, um, kind of unrelated, which is, um, can you direct our audience member to where they can look at jobs that are available at CERN? Jobs. Yep, I we've already think... sold everybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> Everyone well, I think really we have... wants to work at CERN with y'all. Um. There is a web page for jobs. I think if you search jobs CERN, you will immediately find it. It's... I'll go ahead and look it up. It. Yeah. Just do it. Job CERN. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Careers. Careers.cern. That's all it is. Yep. That's all you need. <laughs> I'll drop it in chat. <laughs> oh, you already did. Thank you. Okay, y'all are faster than I am. <laughs> yep. All right. So going back to 2011. Um, so that was a period uh, of change. So we are in a period where um, we had a lot of computing requirements. So they were increasing a lot. Uh, the LHC was running. Um, there was a need for more computing resources. And we had these power constraints in the computer center in Geneva. So we need to expansion options uh, in a different site. Also, we need a business continuity um, it's nice to have different locations because the data center doesn't run only um, processing jobs, batch jobs for to analyze the LHC data, but also it runs all the services for the organization. So having a business continuity plan and on top of that, the disaster recovery. So that's why uh, CERN opened an ten international tender to um, for all the member states to have a, uh, another data center and the Hungary one. So that's why we got that data center um, in Hungary. So the project started in 2011 and the data center was ready in 2013, uh, just in time for the launch of our private OpenStack cloud infrastructure. Where, um, where in Hungary is it? So it's very close to Budapest. Okay. And when I say Wigner, Wigner was the exact location, but is Budapest. 
And then we are in the situation that we know that we can have a new data center, also more servers, but we are still using our manage, managing tools from the beginning of the 2000s, tools that were developed in-house. Uh, it, it was a time that there was nothing available actually to manage a data center uh, of our size in 2000. So we needed to build all these tools. However, the reality in 2011 was completely different. There were a lot of open source projects that um, probably were doing, uh, definitely they were doing a better job and we did much more functionality than the tools that we made in a house. And then other problem was when uh, an organization build their own tools, attracting people to work on those tools is actually very difficult because they only have value inside the organization. And when you arrive there, you need to learn them. And if you leave, uh, uh, that knowledge will not, um, well, it's not interesting for other organizations and companies. So it was a time that we needed to really adopt open, the open source tools available to, to manage our data center. Um, so we start looking to the, all the options available. So why to build uh, also a cloud infrastructure? At that time, everything was running on physical machines, and it's a completely shift, um, not only all the way we manage the data center, but also for all the users. That's, uh, that's all we needed to tell them, well, now we need to transfer these workloads to, to virtual machines. And uh, as you can imagine, a lot of them were server uggers. They liked to have their machines in the center and control them. And this was a huge cultural change. But... <laughs> As everyone knows, so cloud infrastructure brings a lot of advantages, improve operational efficiency, um, the resource efficiency, so the, the possibility to consolidate a lot of servers in uh, one resource, uh, it's, it brings a lot of advantages. And um, something that was quite easy to sell was to you know, improve the responsiveness, because at that time, if someone needed a machine, uh, they needed to fill a lot of forms and uh, maybe after a few weeks or even months, they will get to the physical machine to work on. Having a cloud infrastructure with an API, a cell service, they could immediately take the, that machine. So we started identifying a new tool chain and the things that we clearly need was a configuration management tool. So there were a few options at that time. Um, at that time we decided for, for Puppet and is what we've been using since then. Puppet is not only used to configure the OpenStack infrastructure, but is worldwide used through the organization to configure all the IT services, for example. Monitoring tools, and there are a lot of projects, open source projects that were identified and that we are using today. So Kibana, uh, Search, um, Collect the um, fluent D um, that we are using to manage uh, not only the monitor, not only the open side resources, but all the resources in data center. And the cloud manager tool. So it was a time that there was not much available. Um, when we started really looking into this, this was 2009, um, I started looking to Open Ebola. Open Ebola uh, was an open source tool. Actually, we start looking to open able to virtualize the batch system, and we we were quite successful. We did huge scalability tests because one of the concerns at that time was if these open source tools were able to scale to, to our needs. So we were able to create more than fifteen thousand virtual machines you know, on Open Ebola, which was amazing at that time. Um, that was one of the options, um, but also CERN beginning of 20, 2006, um, was managing a small virtualization tool that was built on top of um, this Microsoft System Center Virtual Machine Manager, where uh, the CERN team basically built a web interface on top of it. And it was a basic web interface where the CERN users could go and uh, create virtual machines, selecting an image, and basically uh, was it. So there was no API interaction. It was only that web interface. Um, it was a virtualization tool, but it was quite popular. So it had in 2011, it had thousands of 
virtual machines running in that Microsoft infrastructure. But that was a time where OpenStack was released, 2010, and that was a game changer. So with all the industry support to this new uh, cloud tool, um, I think it was clear from the beginning that uh, was the right choice for us to, to invest on OpenStack, to understand this tool, um, and to join the community. So we started investigating basically OpenStack from the beginning. Um, this is a presentation that I gave in January 2011 uh, to my management to basically describe my findings about OpenStack. So this was based on the first release of OpenStack, Austin. Um, you can find the presentation in this link. It's quite funny now going back all these given, years and see this presentation. I'm glad that the, I did it. Given the timing, did you consider Eucalyptus or CloudStack at all? Uh, CloudStack was not there yet. Yeah. It was only after. Mm -hmm. uh, Eucalyptus, it was an option, but it... There was not a lot of deployments running Eucalyptus, at, at least at our scale. So it was not, it was never considered as a good option for us. Yeah, I started with Grizzly. I can't imagine starting with Austin. Well, it, it was quite a challenge. <laughs> Going back now into these slides and uh, revisiting all of this, it's, um, it's amazing. So in this slide, this is the architecture of Nova at that time. And uh, yeah, we believe that Nova was complicated at that time with these diagrams. Well, when you see it today, it's completely different. It was a time also where there was only two projects that was Swift and Nova, nothing else. So Glance, I think it was only available on Bexer or Catus. So everything was Nova. Yeah. Even even to create users, you needed to do Nova Manager, user create, something like this. Nova was doing more than just virtual machines at that point, right? So it was doing storage even at that time. We even had networking that was being done. Some people would call that the good old days of a flat network before we <laughs> moved on to quantum and then moving on to uh, Neutron. So well, Nova Network still really works quantum? for us, actually. But the Texan in me has to just clarify, even though it is spelled B-E-X-A-R, it is bear because we pronounce things funny. Yeah. <laughs> Texans do or just us? We have some general. weird city names. <laughs> bear County Michigan. is one of them. Thank you, Amy, to raise that. <laughs> All right. So... This was 2011, and um, so we needed to, to get our hands dirty on this. Um, so we created uh, several prototypes, and the goal was to adding functionality in these different uh, prototypes. So we started with, with what we call Guppy, because it was a very small and fragile animal. And you see that the animals over time get more stronger with more functionality. <laughs> um, well, this was deployed the first prototype with the Fedora 16. Um, why? Because at that time there was the Fedora Cloud Seek team that uh, released the RPMs for Fedora. They were not available for RHEL yet or CentOS. So we used the Fedora because of that. Also, it was a big change for us because this, uh, it was using KVM. And we wanted to use KVM because we thought it was the future. Because until then, in our Open Ebola um, tests, we are always using Zen. Um, but that was a pivotal moment also for KVM. It was integrated on RHEL 6, I believe, and uh, it, it was the only one supported there. We started from the beginning using the OpenStack Puppet modules. Um, actually, we helped them to, to develop the, the initial Puppet modules. Um, with the Puppet Labs at that time, those funny times. Um, and yeah, that was just initially, initially tests. We went then to a different release and we, this was always closed only for us to test. 
And you see that at this time we already moved to CentOS 6 or scientific Linux 6. Um, and also Hyper-V. So you remember that infrastructure that I told you that we had at CERN um, running on top of this Microsoft infrastructure? Um, so we wanted to continue to support that. And we, at that time, believed that the easy way to do it was also to have Hyper-V in the OpenStack infrastructure and then move those machines into OpenStack, but uh, using the same virtualization layer. Um, so you see the challenge. It's, it's a completely new product trying to scale this or to move our own infrastructure to OpenStack, to data centers, and then to different uh, virtualization uh, technologies. Um, Keystone LDAP integration what was also tried during this uh, version. Uh, you can imagine that we have a huge LDAP directory. Um, then the, the last prototype, uh, we opened to some of our, our community. Uh, we tried to put all of the services into AJ, and we had in this prototype more than 600 compute nodes. This was already beginning of 2013. And basically, we launched our cloud infrastructure in July 2013. From the beginning, it was clear that um, if we get serious with this, we need to engage with the OpenStack community because there is no way that we alone will be able to solve all the issues. We'll need the, the help of the community. So you see that the, from early on, we started attending meetups, um, also helping the community and the organizing meetups. This one was at CERN in end of 2013. Um, and this was my first OpenStack summit. This was 2012, I think, in San Francisco. So a long, long time ago. And this was the keynote room. You see how small it, <laughs> it was at that time. Right. So the CERN cloud infrastructure. So we started using scientific Linux 6. So that was in 2013. Um, later, we moved to CentOS, uh, CentOS 7. Um, from the beginning that we are um, using the RDO packaging, uh, it's great uh, to have all these pa packages and all the testing that Red Hat does. Uh, however, we still have projects that we need, need the, some internal packages, so we need to rebuild all of this. And from the beginning that we are using the upstream puppet modules for, for OpenStack. So some, some considerations uh, when we start to building this. So the number of compute nodes, um, we started very small with uh, only a few hundred compute nodes, but we knew that we wanted to move all the data center to, to OpenStack. So at the end is a few thousand compute nodes. So it's, this tool able to, to scale to these numbers. At that time, if you look back, there were not a lot of big sites using OpenStack. So that was always a concern. Uh, different locations, so the data center that I just mentioned. Uh, the growing number of OpenStack projects, that was a time that uh, every week was a new OpenStack project popping up. Um, it was very hard to, to follow all of this. And then there was all this split of functionality that also was happening. So for example, Nova volumes uh, moving to Cinder, um, Nova network moving to Quantum. So this was very difficult to, when we are trying to deploy a series infrastructure, very difficult to manage. Um, also then we add a, a large number of users and projects. Um, a lot of users every month um, leave the organization. Um, so around 100 users leave the organization and the 100 users come back to the organization or join the organization. There is always this constant move of people at CERN. Um, so we needed to automate all of this, um, automation of creation of the projects. When the people leave uh, the organization, all the project removal, uh, all this automation needed to be implemented. And then of course, so when having a large uh, infrastructure, all the automation that is needed to, to manage the infrastructure itself, all the procedures that needs to be figured out because everything is new. So the kind of workloads that we run in the infrastructure, um, 
mainly it's physics data analysis. So all the data from the LHC experiments and many other experiments. IT services, uh, and then many other infrastructure that is required for the organization, the um, experiments services to run the experiments itself, engineering services to develop uh, different tools for the experiments, um, and also personal VMs. So any user at CERN has the possibility to, to have a project and run their desktops, their personal VMs in the infrastructure. So most of our virtual machines are ephemeral. Uh, they, they consume more than 80% of all the CPU cores available in the cloud. And this is what is used for the LHC data processing. And for because this is a very specific use case, we have special configuration for this virtual machine. So we do CPU pass-through. Uh, we have new malware flavors, uh, but also they are ephemeral because they are only processing jobs. So things like line migration, we are not really interested for, for these uh, kind of virtual machines. Then we have the pets that are all the service VMs um, where performance is less important, but what is really important is that we can keep these virtual machines running and the um, Online migration is a huge requirement for, for all of this. Um, it's, a multi, it's a mix of operating systems that we have here. We have a lot of uh, Windows VMs as well. So are these mostly like people's personal environments? So these are people personal environments, but also a lot of services, most of the services of the organization. So 2013 is when we finally open the um, private cloud infrastructure to our users. Uh, we started with two cells and cells at that time was a quite new concept. Not a lot of people were using that. Um, we decided to use cells instead of regions, even if we had two different data centers, um, mainly because we wanted this to be as easy as possible for the users to migrate their workloads to the infrastructure. Uh, I've, these were users, uh, most of them, um, they, they are not computer savvy, uh, but they need to, to manage their, their applications. Uh, physicists, that, that they have their uh, projects. Uh, we wanted to be as easy as possible for them to move their workloads from physical servers to cloud infrastructure. So that's why we wanted to reduce at maximum the number of concepts. So that's why we decided from the beginning to use uh, Nova Cells, and this was Cells V1 at that time. So we had one cell in Geneva and the other cell in Wigner. At that time, we wanted to have a J everywhere because we believed it was uh, good architecture. Um, we didn't want to have a single point of failure. We used Cellometer, um, bad idea. We moved back uh, sometime then after. Um, Glance was Ceph backend, but at the beginning, really, in 2013, it was actually all the images were stored on AFS because the Ceph cluster at that time was not ready. So we had for a few months uh, all the images stored on AFS. And the, we were still doing some Cinder tests. AJ Proxy, uh, that continues. And then we had uh, we had three master nodes per, per cell because this IV ability, RabbitMQ again, RabbitMQ with cluster with the uh, mirror queues. I think not, nothing special, very, very common architecture. So this uh, is a diagram that you can see that we had two cells, Geneva, Wigner. Um, and this is all the services that are running at, at that time. Um, for Salometer, we are running MongoDB for the database. Uh, there was no Gnocchi at that time. Um, StackTac, we, we started running that at that time. It was, uh, it was very good to have a perspective of the service. Um, and then we, we keep more or less the, the same architecture. This is the top cell. Um, the architecture of cells v1 is completely different from cells v1. So that's why you see 
you may not, not recognize the service that we have here from the current architecture of OpenStack. So this was the VM growth. Since we launched for our users in, in July, 2013, and you can see that uh, this is the cumulative number of VMs that were created in cloud. This is only until uh, April, 2017, but the pattern uh, keeps the same uh, after 2017. And this is the number of VMs um, growing. So you see that uh, this was uh, very well adopted by our community. And also we worked quite hard to basically move all the compute, all the physical nodes uh, from the data center to the infrastructure. There are weeks that we are moving more than 100 nodes into the cloud infrastructure. And this was not new hardware. This was converting the existing servers um, into compute nodes. For a while. Right. So when did you get, have all of the, you know, standalone servers been converted or is that something you're still working on? Um, so all the servers that were, that are dedicated to computing uh, are converted. However, not everything in the data center was converted to compute nodes and not everything runs uh, on top of the OpenStack. One example is storage. So it um, doesn't, doesn't make sense uh, to run the storage service um, on top of OpenStack. So um, they continue with bare metal machines uh, managed by the storage team. OK, so those bare metals aren't ironic, but yet you do have ironic as well as Magnum clusters in the system. Right. So Ironic is a quite recent product in, in our clouds. So I, if I remember well, in 2019, it's available since 2018, 2019. Um, Ironic started to, uh, for us, you know, it, it was a requirement because a lot of people, a lot, some of the use cases that, that we had um, didn't fit well virtual machines. So people that really needed a uh, huge virtual machines, a uh, full node virtual machine. So there is not, it didn't make a lot of sense to virtualize uh, that environment for them because they were losing a little bit of, of performance. So we deployed bare metal, the ironic service. And initially um, our goal was to to have an API for, for, for the users to interact with the cloud to, with bare metal, the same way they interacted with virtual machines. But we had bigger goals for Ironic. Not only that, not only having a pool of bare metal nodes for people to use, but also to change all the workflows uh, in the data center. And the, what our goal at that time was to manage all the resources in the data center using bare metal, including the compute nodes. So currently, all the compute nodes in the infrastructure are managed by Ironic. Um, we have this kind of inception, and we have a lot of this in our infrastructure. Was that Can clear, Amy? Yep. So, yeah, so another follow-up question I kind of want to ask is what determines whether it's a VM, a container, or on bare metal? So what determines so it, where the workload goes? So it's quite ironic that we are talking about uh, all this inception and all of these concepts. So now you have the slide scale uh, and quite <laughs> simple. Hmm. Well, go ahead and go through and, and we'll, we'll get to it. Um, no, so th that is a decision of the user. Uh, so the user have all these APIs and if he has Kota, he can create a bare metal nodes or he can create a virtual machine or he can create a container depending on the, in the application that he wants to deploy. Okay. Uh, I, I think I still have one slide about Ironic. I can go then deeper on it. Okay. So as I said, scale implies simple. Uh, because if from the beginning you know that we're gonna manage nodes, 
Um, the, archi the architecture needs to be simple. So this is an overview about our architecture. Um, something that we decided from the beginning was to isolate the OpenStack services. So we don't have few physical nodes, like most of the people, three physical nodes, and we run all the OpenStack control plane in those nodes. So we just, we try to distribute as much as possible. So we have machines that only run Keystone. Uh, we have around 16 of them. We have machines that only run Glance API, Neutron, and so on. Why? Because all this isolation uh, allow us to upgrade all these different OpenStack components independently and uh, allow us to focus in one problem at a time. Then for Nova, uh, also we have uh, this kind of architecture. We run Nova APIs completely isolated. Then we have the level one that is the main control plane for, the, for cell zero, where we have the schedulers and conductors, the, no, the Nova NC proxy. And placement as well is completely isolated from Nova. And even the databases, we have completely isolated instances for each OpenStack project. So we have a MySQL instance for Keystone, one MySQL instance for Glance. And for Nova, we have one independent MySQL instance per cell. And uh, again, is to have this isolation. And then we have the, the cells itself. Um, they are very, very simple. They have the control plane, again, isolated, and then uh, all the compute nodes. So with, what this represents is that we have one control plane or only one server acting as a control plane for around 200 compute nodes. And in total, we have around 80 cells. Can you speak about the benefits of uh, isolating things into different cells? Can you repeat, Mike? Uh, can, yes. Can you uh, talk about the benefits of uh, taking the cells approach of isolating different services within child cells? Like, uh, how did you reach that so, requirement in your infrastructure? And and also for for my sake, for cells, we're talking about sort of groups of physical servers. Yeah. Uh, exactly. It's a logical partition of the Nova deployment. So, so a cell can be a rack, it can be a data center, but it's yeah, a group it, of servers that are together. Yeah, I think this slide is good for this, to explain this. Um, so we decided to, to go through the cell route um, because we didn't have, at the beginning, to have this um, region concept, concept to our users. But actually, cells ha have a lot of benefits. Um, basically, they can act as the failure domains. Um, also, they can allow you to configure those servers in that cell in a particular way. And we are looking at those advantages, um, basically, to, to deploy our infrastructure. For example, you can see here that the our availability zones are basically set of different cells. Meaning that if the cell goes down, the availability zone is not completely down, it's just degraded, okay? And because we have so many cells, means that the control plane that we have for each one, it's only one server, meaning that if that server goes down, the workloads continue to run because it's only the APIs for this particular cell, for these particular resources that will not be available. And also, it has the advantage to distribute all the control plane, meaning that for each cell, we're going to have a completely independent RabbitMQ, meaning that the scaling RabbitMQ will never be a problem for us because uh, the cluster, it's very small. It's just a net maximum of 200 compute nodes. So that's why we never reach uh, scalability issues for RabbitMQ in Nova. I think I have a, I have a slide where I go through the advantages of cells and compare it with regions. That answer your question, Mike? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to give the sense to the audience of the benefits of it. Thank you. Um, 
But what I would like to show with this slide is that we also run all these services that I show you in this slide, Keystone, Glance, Neutron, all the OpenStack control plane. We run it on top of the cloud itself. So the control plane doesn't run in physical machines dedicated for the control plane or doesn't run in a different cloud, only for the control plane. It's running the cloud itself that it manages. Um, so that's why we have this inception uh, again. It's like ironic, as I mentioned early, that manages also the compute nodes, uh, even if it's an OpenStack project. So you see that in the servers, side by side with the user VMs, we have keystones, we have glances, VMs, uh, and so on. And Keystone, for example, and all the other services are distributed between the different availability zones, the same availability process that we give to our users, we use it, and also distributed between the different cells. So that's why we reach high availability for the control plane. It's nice to see you using availability zones. I don't think people take advantage of it as much as they should. So we are exposing availability zones to our users uh, from the beginning. Yeah, because you, uh, you started out with two widely separated data centers. Yeah. Ex uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually, weird techie question here. What What's the actual line lag between uh, CERN oh. and Hungary? Oh, exactly. Just in time. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So between CERN and Wigner, it's uh, 1,600 kilometers. And that translates to around 24 milliseconds of latency. Hmm. Um, and this was at the beginning. We are trying not only to figure out uh, how to set up the new data center, but also to set up OpenStack on top of it. Then we had this legacy, this latency issue as well. Um, what you see in this slide as well is the connections between Wigner and CERN. So we had two network links, 100 gigabits uh, of bandwidth uh, between the two centers, completely redundant. So that's why you see two. And um, after a few years, we also had a third one. So we had a connection um, with, uh, with a total of 300 gigabits per second between the two centers. And this is what Basically, for us, this was like uh, connecting. It was a cloud interconnect um, with the peering networks because it was the same network for people that are used to public clouds. Of course, uh, having the data center there, um, that had some architecture implications, for example, um, we run the databases, we started to run the databases in Geneva, but the latency was so high. And that was a time that we didn't have Nova com Conductor. So all the compute nodes were connecting to the databases at that time. Also, because we are using cells v1, the scheduler was per cell. So we had a scheduler in Wigner that were con connecting to the databases in Geneva. So the user experience at the beginning in Wigner was not that great because it was ex sometimes very slow. So we continued to iterate on this. So databases were deployed in, in the Wigner data center. Um, another thing was Ceph because the Ceph cluster was in Geneva. Uh, so at the beginning, because the latency it was a very bad experience for users to have um, block storage in Wigner. So in 2015, um, a Ceph cluster, the storage team deployed the Ceph cluster in Wigner for this uh, use case to have block storage for the cloud. Um, and other things, for example, um, a Glance cache. Uh, initially, we thought that 24 milliseconds was a lot of latency and uh, we needed to transfer a lot of images to Wigner. So we decided to implement Glance Cache uh, at Wigner. But that turns out it's not really needed because at, after some time, the images are cached at, compute, at the compute node level. 
So it was just an overhead that we had in the architecture. So we removed that. And that was a case that Glance was, the nodes were actually contacting Glance in Geneva without any issue. So you see that there were different and uh, several architecture constraints that we were figuring out over the years. So the data center in Wigner was operational between, uh, or CERN was using that data center, it continues to run, uh, between 2013 and uh, 2019. We knew this from the beginning. It was uh, a contract for only for five years that was extended one more year. Um, by the end of 2018, we were running there 17 over cells, um, 3,300 compute nodes, and uh, for the availability zones there, we had uh, 78 nodes. So early 2019, we started decommissioning the clouds in the Vigna Data Center. And as you can imagine, that was uh, another challenge. So we needed to remove all these um, cells from the infrastructure. And this was completed in November 2019. And one interesting part is that uh, 2,500 servers actually returned to Geneva because um, they were late purchase and um, it was still very good servers. So, and this service was the ones that were added to the computer uh, containers that I show you at the beginning in that picture. Now is Wigner totally going away or are you just moving some servers around? Cause you mentioned putting- So, so now we don't on. use Wigner at all anymore. Okay. All right, so cells versus uh, regions. So I list here some of the advantages uh, of cells and regions to try to, to make it more clear why we went uh, for cells at the beginning. Uh, basically, cells is to shard the Nova deployment. It's, it only applies to Nova. There is no other service that has uh, cells. And that is actually an issue. Uh, isolate server domains and it's completely transparent to users. And uh, one of the things, it's uh, also logical partition for operators and allow us to, to have different configurations for a particular cell and distinguish the different cells with different configurations, which is important for us, for example, for the batch use case that has a completely different configuration for when comparing to the service cells. Regions, uh, they are a completely independent OpenStack environment. Um, so we need to basically deploy all the services, all, all the OpenStack projects in the, independently in, the, in that region. But you have that fault tolerance. It's a completely different environment that should be managed in a completely isolated way. So that is the big advantage. And actually now we are running multiple cells. By multiple, I mean three cells. So in 2013, um, for us, it was more simple to manage one small cell than two small cells. However, when the infrastructure um, grow to, to at this point, it's more simple actually to manage uh, two or three small clouds than one big one. And one of the main reason, reasons that also we move into regions is because Neutron. Um, Neutron, doesn't have this logical partition with cells. And um, it was a big uh, point of failure. So if Neutron was down or, or anything was affecting Neutron, uh, it, it was visible in all the clouds. So all the users will see this. And partitioning Neutron between two, uh, three different regions uh, allow us to, to improve the liability of the cloud a lot. Neutron agents are quite chatty with RabbitMQ cluster. So needs to be a very big RagTime Q cluster, and that is always an issue to, to maintain. Also, the new uh, the, the regions that we have now, um, they are per use case. So one region is focused in the IT services and user VMs. The other two regions is more for, or it's only for um, LHC data processing. So they only have that use cases which for us logically uh, also makes sense uh, the, the way we manage this. So the way you're describing Neutron, it 
sounds like a downgrade. So what are you getting out of upgrading to Neutron? Well, we, we were forced to, to upgrade to Neutron because Nova Network um, is not supported anymore. However, for the old regions, we still we are still running um, Nova Network. So we have six, re six cells where we still run Nova Network um, because we, still, we are still evaluating how we're going to migrate this. It's quite scary migrating from Nova Network to Neutron without interruption of the VMs. Um, just thinking about that uh, the VMs could um, lose network connectivity for some time, it's very scary for us. And those cells are running important service for the organization. So that's why we are still trying to figure out how to, how to do it in the right way. So simple doesn't always uh, plays well with the eye availability, but we try to, to work around this. So that's why we have multiple cells per availability zone, which allow us to, if a cell goes down to, for the availability zone, not to be completely down, which is a very good feature. Um, the cell control plane is not highly available. Um, if it dies, uh, there is no int workload interruption, just people are not able to connect to, to their VMs using the OpenStack APIs or to, to OpenStack operations using the, the APIs in that particular cell. However, um, this simplifies a lot the, the, the deployment because we have around 80 cells. Uh, if we had availability through all these cells control plane, we will have a lot, a lot of control plane to manage. And then as I already mentioned, we also run the, um, the control plane on top of the cloud itself. GravityMQ, it's very challenging to scale and maintain. Um, so we try to not run GravityMQ clusters at all. And we, what we find is that um, if we have very small clusters like we have per cell, GravityMQ is quite stable. Um, and not having the complication of GravityMQ clusters simplifies a lot of deployment and operations. Um, do you want me to go faster? I don't know if uh, we have a hard line to finish. Yeah, Chris, how are we doing? Uh, I mean, we're fine on time. You can go over if you want. No problem. Okay. I'll, I'll try to go faster now. So MySQL databases, um, again, like RabbitMQ, um, we don't have a cluster for, my, for the MySQL databases. So we have independent MySQL instances. And the, the funny thing is most of them run on top of the cloud infrastructure. So the storage is in a NetApp solution, but the instance itself, most of them run on top of the cloud infrastructure. Except few exceptions that we have to for bootstrap issues that we run at them in, on physical servers. So OpenStack, and when we have a cloud infrastructure where, where we want to have a lot of functionality, that translates to a lot of OpenStack projects. And these are the current OpenStack projects that we run. And you see the version that we have uh, now in our cloud. And you see that they are, they are in different versions. And is this isolation of the deployment that allow us to have this. So Nova, still in Stein. One of the main reasons that Nova is still in Stein is because we still have those cells running Nova network. And upgrading now, it's very, very risky. We have a lot of patches for Nova network to continue to run. Um, but you see that most of the services are running very, very um, recent releases. And uh, that is one thing that we always try to keep up with the, the OpenStack release cycle. Um, having so many open, uh, many, uh, many OpenStack projects and managing uh, all of this, and most of them manage uh, thousands of resources. For example, Cinder manages thousands of uh, volumes with the petabytes of storage behind. Um, it's always tricky. For example, Ironic, we have now 
around 8,000 nodes that are managed in Ironic. And we started reaching scalability issues in Ironic. Um, so again, that is one of those things that uh, you, you get if you are scaling the infrastructure. And uh, fortunately, there is this functionality conductor groups that is more or less like Nova cells in Ironic, and now we are taking advantage of this. So splitting logically the Ironic deployment. Scale also means staging. Uh, even if we try to upgrade most of the services every six months, the configuration is always changing. Um, so the configuration through the puppet models is always changing. So trying to have a CI CD uh, testing everything before we deploy into production is quite important. And we have a staging pro process to have everything first on pre-stage testing in a small number of nodes, then QA, and then going through different master levels that you'll reach everyone in the infrastructure. Test stack is what we call to our testing infrastructure, very few, few nodes to test upgrades and new configuration options. Scale also translates into automation. Um, we are using several projects for automation. Uh, for example, Raleigh to probe the infrastructure every day. Raleigh deploys thousands of virtual machines in the infrastructure just to make sure that every cell is okay and um, everything is running as intended. Uh, Rendec, it's um, a project that we use a lot for operations. For example, we have different teams. Um, the repair team, for example, doesn't have access to the OpenStack resources. Uh, however, we have all these procedures and run back jobs that they can trigger. For example, when uh, a node is, uh, needs a repair, they can trigger a job that will basically try to lie migrate all the instances in that node, notify the users. If that is not possible, that uh, that node needs um, a uh, repair intervention. And then we have Mistral. Mistral is also an OpenStack project that we use for workflows, for example, uh, for all the projects creations and uh, all the projects uh, removal when a user leaves organization. So going through all the resources from the users and make sure that they are deleted. And all of this is automated. Scale also means permanent changes. So upgrades through the OpenStack release cycle is every six months. Um, so we run 15 OpenStack projects. So as you can imagine, every it's almost an upgrade day for us. Um, and then also we have the open operating systems distributions upgrade. So we started with scientific Linux 6. Uh, at some point, we needed to upgrade to CentOS 7. This is never easy. Um, there is no easy way to move from 6 to 7. It's a required reinstallation in our case. And now we are facing again the move from CentOS 7 to CentOS 8 and stream, um, and we are working on this. Hardware commissions, so every around five years, um, copy nodes need to be the commission. Um, and as you can imagine, a lot of live migrations need to happen to try to do this transparent to the users. So recently, uh, we just um, removed around um, or we line migrated around nine, 900 virtual machines because we are the commission some cells and we continue to do it. Um, this is a lot of work. We wrote a recent blog post. You can follow our work here. Security, um, as you all know, so Meltdown, Spectre, a couple of years ago created a lot of fuzz. So we needed to actually reboot um, most of our cloud infrastructure because of this. Um, also disable hyper-threading, uh, redu reducing the number of cores available. And these operations, when you have thousands of nodes, it's uh, a lot of planning, um, a lot of work. Currently, for kernel upgrades, we are trying to automate this because when we have all these, virtual, uh, these compute nodes running, they run for years. And... Um, Upgrading the kernel is quite difficult without disrupting the user. So we are trying to automate this to basically having a tool that continues live migrate the instances in the infrastructure. And when the compute node is empty, just reboots the compute node for the kernel upgrade. And 
scale, it's of course teamwork. Um, so at CERN, the core OpenStack team, it's um, six, seven people. But over the years, we had the participation of thousands, dozens of uh, different students, fellows, project associates um, that joined the team for a few periods of time and uh, contributed a lot for, for this project. So these are my slides. I didn't intend to take so long to, <laughs> to go through them. No worries. No, this was great. Yeah. You know, for people who didn't know what CERN was, I think they got a really good understanding of it. And, you know, the infrastructure, the fact that you are running different versions of OpenStack based on what project is something that most people don't do. And you all have really good reasons for why you're doing it. Right. So right. I'm happy to, to answer your questions. Um, also, so, the audience, they, they can follow me on Twitter, uh, ask me questions there, um, send questions through the email. I'm happy to answer them. Wonderful. That'll be great. Thank you so much, Belmiro, for joining us today. This was really good. Very informative. Well, thank you never would have expected the number of problems CERN has with infrastructure. Uh, okay. Question just came in though. Yep, I got it. Have you ever considered any other bare metal provisioning other than ironic? Interesting. Uh, so ironic was a quite easy decision for us because we had all this uh, infrastructure based on OpenStack. So it was the natural choice for us. Also having the possibility to have exactly the same API to create virtual machines um, and bare metal nodes, it was quite attractive. And it's, I think it's a real advantage for us. So the user doesn't need to learn a different API, a different command line to this. So Ironic was always, uh, I think, the, the most attractive solution to us. I know we're going to have a little bit of a lag, but go toss one. Did that answer your question? Well, he's responding. I do have one of my own since I'm coming here from container land. Right. Um, one of my questions is, um, are you already running some workloads that are distributed as container images? Um, and if not, are you planning on it? So at CERN, there are uh, different teams that are using containers for, for to deploy their applications. So as you saw in the in one of the slides, mm -hmm. we have more than 600 um, Magnum clusters, mm -hmm. and most of them, or almost all of them, are Kubernetes clusters. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of applications uh, using containers as their deployment method. We also start playing with um, containers to deploy OpenStack. Uh, we recently, we are experimenting with one region, trying to deploy OpenStack uh, on top of Kubernetes using the Elm shards, uh, OpenStack Elm shards, and um, we are experimenting with it. Currently, for example, in production, we have half of the Glance requests going through Glance that is deployed in a Kubernetes cluster. Cool. That answers your question, Josh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, out of just okay. sheer curiosity, I mean, how many maintainers of OpenStack do you have? Like, I'm, I'm always curious about team topologies and size and stuff like that. So we, we are seven core wow. members that, um, but then we have all these fellows and project associates that joins our team. Uh, but usually they don't do operations. And they do more uh, investigative work, like looking for different projects, evaluate uh, different open stack projects or Kubernetes associated projects. And then if we think uh, 
it's worth to to invest in those projects. Uh, so then we go further and we try to to implement them to deploy them in the cloud. Awesome. So another so question for, coming in. Go ahead. So Sorry. let me just continue in, in that uh, in, in your question. So currently we have um, some people doing work on GPUs, trying to understand how to to have GPUs in the clouds. Uh, other people looking to how to have uh, functions as a service in the cloud, for example. We have all these different projects um, that are always going on. I'm a, I can only imagine how many different projects are going on at any given moment, given the resources that are available. Um, have you collaborated with any other scientific organizations about your infrastructure specifically? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so at the beginning, we collaborated a lot with Nectar, for example, that is okay. um, scientific, scientific uh, research network in Australia. Okay. And at that time, they were using OpenStack. They are still doing, uh, and they were quite big. And we changed a lot of ideas how to deploy OpenStack. Uh, more recently, we collaborate with um, SKA, that is the Square Kilometer Array. Mm. It's the, basically, is the biggest or will be the biggest telescope telescope in the world. Uh, with the sites in um, South Africa and also Australia for observation. Uh, we did interesting projects with them. For example, um, preemptable instances. Um, nice. So they are not available in OpenStack by default. So we collaborated with SKA to develop this. Um, also running cl uh, Kubernetes clusters on bare metal. There, there was a lot of work that was done in collaboration, for example, with SKA in this area. Cool. Awesome. All right. So I dropped links to both uh, Nectar and SKA in the chat if folks are curious about what those organizations are all about. Uh, if there's anything else, feel free to reach out to me question-wise, short at redhat.com. I can pass it along to Bill Muro and the team here. Um, but without any further questions, I think we'll wrap up here. So thank you very much, Bill Muro. This was an awesome presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Bill Muro. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Nice seeing you. All right. Take it easy and stay safe. Reminder, folks, Red Hat is having a recharge day tomorrow, so we will be off the air completely. And Monday is a U.S. holiday, so we will see y'all on Tuesday. Stay safe out there. Take care.